marriage class we have on Wednesday nights, uh, we have a great uh, group of guys and gals who meet in several places. And I am just amazed at times at some of the testimonies that I hear of what God has done. That last song that we sang, uh, When the sun sets free, shall we free thee? Well, there's a man, and I'm not, I'm not helping you, David. Uh, David Luhan has um, shared his testimony in little pieces in our group. And uh, he was in prison for many, many years, he'll tell you. And Jesus set him free. And uh, I just said, I said, David, could you share your testimony? Well, he doesn't speak publicly. He doesn't share his testimony publicly. So I think today might be the first time in church. Say a prayer for him as he comes and shares with us. And he always gives all the glory and praise to God. Definitely. You can tell him just by looking in his eyes that he's a changed man that Jesus has set him free. And he's going to share his testimony now. And I'm really looking forward to it. Let me pray for you. Ed. Come on up and let, let's pray for him as he comes up. Lord, speak through David. Help him not to be nervous. Help him to do this in his heart. Help him to, to focus completely on you as he shares what you've done in his life. Give him a hand. Thank you, Pastor Bob, for giving me this opportunity to share. It's a story that God has created in my life. Hello, congregation. My name is David. My wife and I have been attending nerve classes graciously offered to us here at Modesto Free Methodist. Our time here in fellowship has been rewarding as well as encouraging to our faith. I was asked by Pastor Barack, Brock if I might consider sharing my testimony. I would admit before you all today that I have previously been asked on several occasions since my return home might I consider giving my testimony publicly. Privately since my return home, God has afforded me numerous opportunities to share His grace in my life. Prior to today, what lay at the root of my hesitation are fears that God is still working out in my life. Fears consisting of revealing my past, fears of perceived judgments. I find comfort today in realizing that God has previously enabled me to overcome very similar fears. Ironically, then I feared communicating my present reality, that I had become a new creature in Christ to cohorts that viewed this as a weakness and as a crutch. I feared being vulnerable now that Christ had removed my heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. Today I find great hope and comfort in knowing that the same grace of God who enabled me to overcome yesterday's fears will one day make a way to remove today's fears. And so it is that I stand before you today, brothers and sisters, to share not my testimony, but rather the testimony of Jesus Christ's grace in my life. Of all the wonderful, of all the wonderful work he has already performed, and the hope of the work yet to come as I grow in his grace. I take great comfort as well in realizing that each one of us is in the process of being conformed to the image of our Redeemer, and that each one of us carry a testimony of our Savior's grace in our own lives. My story begins several months shy of my 16th birthday, August the 7th, 1981. On that hot August day, I, I was making my best attempt to fit all my worldly possessions into several large suitcases my mother had thought it best that I would live with my father in Texas because of the negative influences she believed my older brothers were providing. I come from a rather large family, seven sisters and five brothers. I'd be in the youngest of the boys. The day is indelibly etched in my mind for so many reasons. My mother had made arrangements for me to travel to Texas on the bus. However, as time in would have it, my older brother happened to arrive at our home, offering to take me to Texas to my father. I recall as if, as if it were yesterday, my mother's reaction upon hearing this. I distinctly recall how upset she was at the idea as she became increasingly aware that I had decided to go with them. She became distraught and led me to the, led me by the hand to our backyard. 
For she then, with tears rolling down her eyes, pleaded with me not to go, for she feared something terrible was about to happen. I was much too young to understand mother's intuition. I assured her I would be fine and proceeded to leave with them. It quickly became apparent that my mother's concerns were very, were indeed very valid. The situation quickly spiraled out of control, and the end result was that a man was brutally tra traumatized by my brother and his friends. In the legal proceedings that, that ensued on three separate occasions, I was offered full immunity of prosecution on the condition that I testify against my brother. On all three occasions, I declined, primarily because I was raised by a family and a community that I felt at the time did not afford me a choice. Thus, as a result of my decision, I was charged as an adult accomplice. I was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to a life sentence. In an instant, I became part of the 8% of those incarcerated that will likely never be released. At the time, I was the youngest person in California to enter a maximum security prison. I recall vividly being picked up at a juvenile hall for minors by a prison bus full to capacity of seasoned convicts. They chided me about the idea that if I didn't straighten out, one day I would be going to prison like themselves. They were under the impression that I was just hitching a ride to another juvenile facility. I can still recall the look of revolution on their faces as well as the correctional staff at the maximum security prison when we arrived. As we stepped off the bus and were ordered to line up, the captain of the guards, clipboard in hand, proceeded to inform us of our new names. I was assigned C46737, and for the next 35 years, that became my new name, my new identity. I suspect there are a wide variety of perceptions about what prison is like. I'm here to share with you what prison is not. It is not a place conducive to humanity. Thus, it is virtually void of empathy, compassion, and kindness. In fact, in the economy of prison, these are all viewed as vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities in a place that fosters hate leaves one more vulnerable. It soon became apparent to me that if I was to survive this hate filled environment, I needed to emotionally check out. And thus began my journey of losing myself and my own wilderness until I became the man that I never wanted to be. In the years that preceded, I set out to create a very external identity for myself of a hardened criminal. The preceding 25 years saw me wandering aimlessly in the dark recesses of multiple maximum security prisons, witnessing cruelty on a level that is unspeakable. I survived multiple attempts on my life and bear the scars of one that reminds me that it wasn't all just a horrible nightmare. Sprinkled throughout these years, periodically the light of Christ would pierce the darkness in the form of individuals that would share with me the hope of the gospel. This would trigger childhood memories of often strangers telling me that Jesus loved me. Those words would always grab my attention, perhaps because they were words I was not accustomed to as a child. One such light in the darkness that Christ brought forth in my life was Dr. Williams. It wasn't until some time later that I learned it was Dr. Williams' first week working in prison, as well as practicing the profession. Upon completing medical school, he became a well-established and successful music producer. I would learn much later that he felt God leading him to go and practice his profession of healing. However, he never anticipated it would be behind prison walls, as he never expected healing the sick and free healing souls by the power of the gospel. I had no way of knowing then but when I walked into Dr. Williams' office that day, <clears throat> that he quietly had been wrestling with God over his purpose in this God-forsaken place. After our visit, he would later tell me that it was at that moment he came to know his purpose. That day I went to get healing for my body and receive healing for my soul as he shared the gospel with me. And so it was for the next few years. I had Friday appointments with Dr. Williams. I suspect the rest of the medical staff believed that was in pretty rough shape because of all the doctor visits. <laughs> Dr. Williams certainly planted the seeds of hope. Unfortunately, God's increase had not yet come to me, primarily because I wanted God on my own terms. The outcome of this thinking would lead me to a divine appointment 
that I couldn't at the time even imagine in lieu of, of the darkness I found myself engulfed in. Once again, I managed to earn a year-long stay in solitary confinement. As I waited for transportation to my solitary cell in another prison, Dr. Williams kept our appointments, except now he visited me in my cell. It was during one of these last visits that he brought news of my mother's passing. I soon found myself in my new solitary cell with a Bible. Little could I have known then that it was all I needed. I recall setting out to know God again on my own terms. I recall being determined to read this Bible from cover to cover, which I did, and coming away feeling exactly the same. I recall feeling dejected and even angry that I knew no more than when I first started. Then one night, there in my despair, it powerfully came to me that Jesus draws near to the humble and resists the proud. It was there in that moment that I caught a glimpse of how prideful I had been. I experienced, I experienced a humbling experience that enabled me to pick up the scriptures with a different heart. It was then that the scriptures became alive to me in such a way that it is difficult to capture into words today. There was more in me that night, a thirst and a hunger for God's word that I know today was supernatural. It was in these days that one night I found myself prostrate before God, having completely bowed my heart, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had been reborn. The months that followed found me deeply desiring to proclaim the gospel to whomever was with me in the air. I'm sure there were many in those days that suspected I had fully gone off the rails. Still I proclaimed. After my year was completed, I was released to the general population. There I encountered old friends and acquaintances. I fearfully, yet hopefully, proclaimed to them that I was a new creature in Christ. I became active in the small community of believers there and led several Bible study groups, all the while learning to walk in the light of Christ. During these years, I would write lengthy letters to my wife, sharing the hope I had found. She would later confess to me that when I spoke so intimately of Christ, she would feel this jealousy. My wife would come to serve the Lord and want to become a powerful warrior of God. The following years brought forth many changes in me as well as a deepening understanding of God, a deeper intimacy with my Redeemer. For the next 10 years, my life attested to the fact that I was no longer the same person. As I was being conformed to the image of Christ, those in authority took notice. And the day came at my 13th parole hearing, I heard for the first time, parole granted, based on your conduct. So it was it was on January the 21st, 2016. At the age of 51, I was released from a life sentence without doubt as a direct result of God's grace in my life. I'm a firm believer today that in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. Often today, as a result of the work that I do with that misuse, I'm referred to as a life firm. Initially, I was disturbed by this label, yet as so often has been the case in my walk, the Holy Spirit, in a moment of stillness, was there to remind me that my identity today is not in the labels of the world I cast upon me. My identity was forever changed in the midst of that darkness that surrounded me. It was then that I went from being a lifer to an, to an eternal lifer. To God be the glory.
here this morning worshiping your name, precious Jesus. And Lord, we just ask that you come here and fall fresh on each one of us this morning, Father God. Lord, we thank you for the testimony that was short of sharing, Father God. We thank you for the words of these songs, Father God. And Lord, I just ask that you be with each person who's come up to the altar. Those who are still in their seats, Father God, who have something going on. Or maybe they're just praising you this morning, Father God. We just thank you. We thank you for who you are. We know that you are our mind, Father God. Move in us and move in this place, Father God. Be with our speaker this morning. In your name, amen. Like 
the seat. Let's come. One, two, three, four. You each get two of them. You each get two of them, okay? Thanks for listening. There you are. Now, you can go to kids' church or go be with your parents if you want to, whichever you want. But you put the palm branch in the, in the middle so that when the adults walk out, they'll all slip on them, okay? You can come back and keep them if you want to, but I don't want you to bring them to kids' church because I don't want you to play, to play with them. Here, I guess I, I, I guess I only have one apiece because there's so many kids here. That's great. to church to teach them good things and sometimes I'm not the best teacher. <laughs> now they go to to have fun, right? Don't slip on those palms. As you're leaving, I don't think you will. Oh, I was going to share something with you. I found these uh, kind of in the church here. Someone left them. Jeremiah, I think he's a little... One of the little guys in our church, isn't he? Really? Yeah. And it looks like he wrote, like he wrote Jesus, and he wrote this big heart and put a cross on it and, and put his name on that. And I thought that was so cool. You know, our, our kids' ministry is a fantastic ministry on Sundays and Wednesdays. We have a musical coming up. Kids are practicing. And I thought, it is so cool for kids to get a really, really positive love uh, messages and teaching. Uh, throughout the week because our world is such a dark place and to have a, a ray of sunshine when they come to church and my grandkids said oh we're so glad that we can come to church we love going to your church and I, I think that's the way church ought to be and I just want to thank all the people that help in the kids ministry you are really doing the work of God <coughs> I've been doing a series on on I am saved and Today, I, last week I talked about the history of salvation in the history of the world, how all the Bible really is a story of God trying to save people, uh, Abraham, Moses, and uh, all the great heroes of the Bible. These were people that were sent to save the people, and finally Jesus sent his own son. Well, it's interesting because the Bible talks about you were saved, Salvation was an event that was secured for us by Jesus' death on the cross, the forgiveness of our sins. But most of the time when the Bible talks about that word saved, it says we are being saved. Which is kind of odd because if you accept Jesus, then you're saved, right? But yet the Bible talks about being saved. Because salvation is a process. I'm not talking about justification. I'm not talking about being forgiven. That has happened once and for all. But the process of God coming into our life and making us more like Jesus Christ, being saved, salvation is a process in the Bible. It all started out at the very beginning. We were made in God's image. Now that doesn't mean that physically God looks like a human being, although when I visualize God, I kind of visualize him as kind of an older Jesus. Any of you do that? You know? You have this image in your mind, right? But he may not actually look physically like us. When it says that we're made in his image, it's talking about the qualities that we have. It's talking about intellectual qualities, qualities of governance. Uh, he gave us dominion over the world, wanting to organize and, and work together, uh, community. And the, uh, the moral quality, the spiritual quality. Uh, so we're made in that image of God. But when mankind sinned in Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, that image was changed or marred. And the first sin, by the way, was not pride. The first sin was unbelief. Read in Genesis, uh, Satan says, well, God's uh, 
said this, but this is what I say. Don't believe God, believe me. The first sin was unbelief. Believing the lie and unbelief in God was the first sin. And that's the foundation of all uh, sin. It starts as, it, as, as its kernel at unbelief. So mankind sinned in Adam and Eve. And Paul talks about that in Romans 5.12. He says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Uh, that whole section of chapter 5 is worth reading. I don't want to read it today, but he's talking about how sin entered the world and how sin uh, was redeemed or taken care of by God's grace. That whole chapter is about that. So God's image was marred, and the Bible describes the state of humankind uh, mankind who has rejected God as being in a state of death. Adam and Eve, physical death began in them, but spiritual death was immediate. They were separated from the source of life, separated from God. Now, sin is slow death. It leads to destruction of relationships and then finally physical, mental, and spiritual <coughs> death. The Bible describes in various places what happens to people when they choose unbelief. Atheism or unbelief leads to pride or self-will, seeking to uh, do your own thing because you don't want to do it with God and, and allow God to have lordship over your life. You do your own thing and you become your own lord, your own God. Then that's idolatry. And then there's it is followed up by the desires of the flesh, the love of the world, and eventually an insatiable thirst which cannot be quenched. Because mankind was made to be in union with God and with one another, and when separation occurs, we feel lonely and incomplete. We feel thirsty. That leads to hopelessness, for men and women are incapable of helping themselves as they're alienated from God, and they are in darkness and blindness, the Bible says. Their only hope is a Savior. In Romans 5, 15 through 17, the Apostle Paul says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, speaking of Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So just as through the initial man and woman, mankind, sin came and resulted in death, the Apostle Paul is saying by a man, Jesus Christ, Sin was overcome. God's grace and mercy came to mankind. He saved us. The Savior is the answer. He brings with him God's grace, salvation, forgiveness, and a new life. Just like David was talking about. He comes into our darkness and he brings us a new life, a new identity. In Romans 5.20 is one of the best verses in the whole Bible about grace. It's an incredible verse. And when you first read over it in the English version, you don't really get the full sense, but if you do some, a little bit deeper study, I'll bring that out, you get a full sense of what this verse is talking about. He says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. We have a conscience. We have God's law written on our hearts. And it's that conscience that dogs us until we get to the place where we're so evil that we no longer even hear our conscience. But very few people, I think, are in that state. But our conscience dogs us. It convinces us and teaches us that, no, we're not doing what's right. We just can't seem to live up to our conscience, what, what is right. <coughs> but it says, as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. There are actually two words here for abundant. The first one is, as sin became abundant, and then the second word is like a super compound of it, and it actually means superabundance. So just as sin became abundant, God's grace became superabundant, way greater than any sin. How do we receive that abundance, that grace? How does it operate in our lives? All the some of the great teachers and leaders in, in our past, in our history, or our history of the Free Methodist Church even. Uh, of course, there's the Apostle Paul who found God's incredible grace on the road to Damascus. When he was seeking to do God's will and persecuting the church, living 
by the law as best he could, really fulfilling uh, the law, and yet not living in love. And uh, he found that grace of God. Later on during the Reformation, the great uh, leader Martin Luther found God's grace when he had tried and tried and tried to live according to, to what he felt like God wanted him to live, and he couldn't, and he finally found that he just had to ask God for forgiveness and rely on God's mercy and grace. And Wesley found the same thing. He says, my heart was strangely warm. He tried to be, a, he was a missionary, he was a Bible uh, teacher. He tried to follow God, and he just couldn't live up to what his conscience and what his heart was saying, and finally he had to give his heart over to God. He said, my heart was strangely warmed as they read Luther's preface to Galatians, which, in which Luther talks about you can't come to God through your own works, your own righteousness. You have to just simply come humbly kneeling, humbly before God and ask his forgiveness. Like David said, he said, he tried to do it. He tried to read the Bible. did nothing for him. He finally he humbled his heart and he came to God and that's when God came to him. In Ephesians 2, chapters 8 through 10, it kind of sums it up. God saved you by his grace when you believe and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Since we were created to do good works, we mistakenly believe that it's by doing good works that we are accepted by God and that we feel that our life is complete. Because we were created for good works. Okay? But without a relationship with, with God, the good works are empty. And we can't feel right before God and feel accepted before God and feel complete in ourselves until we restore our relationship with God by simply opening up and accepting His grace in our lives. But we get it mixed up. We get the cart before the horse, right? You heard that expression? The cart before the horse. Well, the horse is grace. And the cart is works, but we get it mixed up. We think the we've got the works before the cart, before the horse. That's a terrible analogy. That wasn't down there, was it? No, it wasn't in there. But it's true, isn't it? We try to earn our way into heaven. We try to to work our way and be good people. And it's great to be good people because when we do good works, we do feel good because that's what we we're created to do. But it doesn't give us a completeness. It doesn't give us a wholeness. It doesn't give us that relationship with God. Only opening up and accepting his love and forgiveness, understanding who he is and, and restoring that relationship, that's the only thing that really helps to fill that emptiness that we have inside. Now, how do we receive that grace? Jesus talked about it in uh, John the book of John, he talks more about the Holy Spirit and how we receive that grace. Grace is simply the Holy Spirit operating in our lives, by the way. That's what it actually looks like. He says in John chapter 16, But now I'm going away, Jesus says, to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Of course, he's talking about his death and resurrection and going back to heaven. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I go... The Advocate, uh, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, <coughs> convicts us of sin. He's the light that shines into our house, and all of a sudden we see that our house is dirty when he turns on the light. He convicts us of sin. The other thing he does is he brings truth. In verse 13 it says in that chapter, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. So the Holy Spirit 
helps us to see through the lies that our, that our minds and hearts have been in, the lies of Satan. He helps us to see the truth. And unfortunately, when he first comes, when he first convicts us and we see the truth, he also helps us see the future. And he says, if you keep going the, the direction that you're going, this is what your future is going to be. Death. So the Holy Spirit is the one who brings that conviction. When I talk to someone about Jesus Christ, I don't need to try to convict them of sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. In John chapter 4, he says, someone else is doing the hard work. He's speaking of the Spirit. The Spirit does the hard work in our lives. Our lives get hard. Sometimes because of stuff that we've been through, we harden ourselves against the world, against the outside, against everything, and we just pull within ourselves. The Holy Spirit breaks that up and humbles us to where we can open up and receive God. We can hear the truth. We can see the truth. We see our future. Like in, the, um, in that show at Christmas time um, where uh, Scrooge, where he sees the future. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. It says, if you continue down the path that you're going, even though everybody else thinks you're a great person, I know what's going on in your heart. I know where you're going. I know the direction that you're going. This is the direction you're going. So he brings that truth to us. And the response to the Holy Spirit in our lives is after that truth comes, after that conviction comes, then he brings his grace to us. He says, here's the answer. You need to see yourself the way you really are. You need to open up and accept the forgiveness that I'm offering to you. You need to open up your heart and allow me to come into your life. Quit trying to be your own God. Do your own thing. Allow me to come in and help you with your life. What's the response? How does that happen? Well, when we first hear the preaching of the gospel, the good news, the, the news of grace, John Wesley said, talked about this progression, and I think he's right. When we first hear it, there's an awakening within us. And our first response is to seek to do good works. That's the first response when we first hear the good news. That's great. I'm going to do good works. And so when you see someone doing good works, a good person, that's a positive. Because all the good works and all the good things we do has to do with a little bit of that image of God that's still in us, that, that we're created to do good works. So the first response when someone hears the preaching of the gospel is not necessarily to say, oh, I humble myself and I open up and I accept Jesus. No, the first response usually is, well, I, I hear that I, Jesus was such a good person, I'll try to be like Jesus. I'll be good too. That's the first response. So that's not a negative you know, that, that's good. If a person has been bad and they start doing good, that's good, isn't it? And they're going coming towards God. Well, then they find out that they can't measure up. No matter how good I try to be, no matter how much I do, I'm still not good enough. I still don't feel like I'm good enough. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. That's what Wesley said. That's what Luther said. They tried and tried and tried, but they're just not quite good enough. You finally come to the place where you're humbled and you say, God, I can't do it. I need your help. I need a savior. You need to save me. Like they say in AA, you, you admit that you're powerless. And you come to God. And it's at that point in time that God comes to you with his love and grace. See, that's part of repentance. The process of repentance is to try to be good on your own and finally realize that you can't, and finally realize that there's only one who is good, there's only one Savior, you're not, you're not your own Savior, Jesus is your Savior, and come to Him. And the baptism is a symbol of washing away of the old life and becoming a new person. You, Jesus comes into your life and you say, Lord, I need you to make me a new person. And after that, you have an assurance that comes to you. Paul talks about it in Romans. He talks about how your spirit and God's spirit meet up and you realize that you are a child of God. It's in Romans 8, 15 through 17. I've got a slide on that. 
So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. We just sang about that. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And David talked about how he had a new identity in Christ. He wasn't the same old person. And that's what happens. We have a new identity in Christ. You see, we want to come to God, and we think that we're going to come to God if we obey him, then he'll accept us. But that's not the way it works. We're out of order again. He accepts us and forgives us, and then out of love and relationship, we seek to obey him. We are accepted by God, even though we are not worthy of him. We are not worthy of acceptance. Jesus Christ has redeemed us, has bought us, has provided the price. Jesus Christ has come in and provided the worthiness. It's his righteousness that we receive. And we, and in our heart, then we know, I'm a child of God. I'm not the same person again. We have a new identity in Christ. And that is so important. If you read the scriptures, you'll see this over and over and over again, especially in Paul's writing. He's like in Ephesians. He'll spend the first three chapters talking about your identity, who you are in Jesus Christ. And then he says, since you are this in Christ, this is how you are to live. Because knowing who you are and knowing who loves you provides the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that enables you to go beyond what you can do on your own. And you can never do it on your own. All that you do is by the grace and power of Jesus Christ in your life. So you accept forgiveness for the old life. You start your new life. You're a new creature in Christ, as David said. And people can't believe it. I'm sure at times in prison, because you were, quote, the tough guy from the age of 16 on for 20-some years, people are going, oh, he's just doing this so that he can get out of prison. And I'm sure some, some people do. They say, well, oh, he's just trying to, he's trying to do a tactic to, to get parole, you know. But after a while, the proof's in the pudding, right? After a while, they see that your life has changed. You're not changing because of them. You're changing because of your relationship with Jesus. And after a while, people start seeing it, and they can't believe it. They can't believe the change. And, and just, you know, they go, well, I can't even stop chewing gum. And look what changes he's made. All these changes, you know. And then as Christ comes in and works in our lives, and we originally just humbly repented and opened up and said, I, I'm unworthy, just accept me, Jesus. Forgive me. And then after a while, we get to the place where we say, you know, this life with Christ is going so well. I want to give 100%. There's just some areas of my life that I think I'm holding back. I want to give 100% to you. That's what the Bible calls sanctification. Entire sanctification is the theological word. Sanctify means being separated, set apart for God. I want to set myself 100% apart for God. I want all of your love. Yeah, I'm not doing all that stuff I used to do. But my heart is not as loving as it needs to be. I don't love you enough, and I'm, I'm not showing love, and I'm not being loving to other people as much as I'd like. Lord, I need all of you. I need you to fill me with your spirit, and I need to 100% commit my life to you. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in Romans also. Romans 12, he says, and he's speaking here to Christians, by the way, who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will here for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. He says, present yourself as a living 
sacrifice to God. And then he will transform your thinking and you won't have those struggles anymore. Not that you won't be tempted, but your thinking will be transformed. You'll have a different <coughs> mindset. You won't be pushed and, and uh, shaped by a, the world view around you. You'll have an inner uh, transformation that comes from the Holy Spirit, an inner Holy Spirit way of looking at things. You start seeing things the way God sees them. Well, we were in slavery to sin, but God brought us back through his son, Jesus Christ. Now we present ourselves to him. And he enables us then to walk in love, love of God and neighbor. That's what they, we call in the Bible holiness. It's the last process of salvation here on this earth before we meet Jesus. So everything I've talked to you about is a process of salvation. It starts with an awakening and awareness of God. And then it goes to a conviction of sin. Then it goes to a realization that you can't do it on your own and opening up and receiving Jesus as your Savior. And then it goes to the place where finally you are sanctified, where you say, I'm not completely given, I give myself totally to you. And just as there's a process of salvation, there can be a process of unsalvation or deconversion. Maybe you have even been sanctified. You've given yourself wholly to the Lord. But the reverse can happen. It starts by not growing and not walking daily with God. That's the final part, right? Walking daily with God. It starts by not, by not walking daily with God. There's a deadening of love towards God and other people. And then after that, there's a dependence upon self and legalism. And then in the church, we have people that think that they're sanctified, but they've slipped, and now they're legalistic. They think they're perfect, and they're judging everybody else. That's a sign you're not sanctified, because you've lost your humility. Legalism. And then there's, from there, it can go to a deadening of conscience. Since I'm perfect, I don't even see the faults in myself, and you're no longer listening to the Holy Spirit, then your mind starts being molded by the stuff that's out there rather than the transforming uh, power of the Holy Spirit within your life. You have worldly thinking. And it can finally end in abandonment of belief. And you're back where we all started at unbelief, which is the core of, of what caused mankind and God to be separated in the beginning. And finally, you're in darkness, headed for death. But even a person who's deconverted can go back through the process starting with an awakening and an awareness of God. God in the Old Testament says, you will find me if you look for me with all your heart. That's what it says. Israel had reached a place where they, they had abandoned God, but God said you can still come back and you can find me if you look at and I know that we know people, maybe we've even been there at, at times, or in our lives, some of us maybe, where we have slipped and we've abandoned, but we can believe and we can see, and by faith we can believe that God will work again in people's hearts and we can see that progression of salvation. They can find the Lord. And it's interesting, Revelation 3.20 is a verse that I memorized. And I memorized it to lead someone to Jesus for the first time. And the, the verse is, Jesus is talking, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice, uh, they can open the door and I'll come in and fellowship with them and eat with them. But if you look at the context of Revelation chapter 3, it's really not talking about someone who finds Jesus for the first time. It's talking about someone who came back to God. And so as long as Jesus is knocking at your door, <coughs> You're not without hope. Open the door. Give him a, a chance. Begin that awakening of belief in God. And then his salvation will come. His grace will come. And you will find that Jesus truly, truly, truly does save. Got a quote from Eugene Peterson here. The first step toward God is a step away from the lies of the world. 
Believe. Opposite is unbelief. Believe. Believe the good news that Jesus loves you, died for you, accept him into your life. So where are you? I want you to get, take out the next step cards. Everybody here, if you can, if you can find one, uh, and there's a pen there, I want you all to take it out, because I'm going to take a little bit of time. And I want you to think through where you're at, okay, in your relationship with God. Now, it's not likely that there'd be too many people here that we totally lost or in darkness, because if you were lost in darkness, you probably wouldn't come to church today. You would be open to it. But you may know someone that you do. I don't know for sure, because I can't read their heart, but boy, they seem like they're lost in the darkness. And you could write their name as a prayer request if you want to. It might be a friend or a relative even. But where are you? Are you lost in darkness? What's the next step? The next step is to believe, to reach out to God, to want to see a change. So the next step is to begin to repent. You might want to try to do good. So one of the interesting things about a new ways of doing evangelism is that they have this servant evangelism. And one of the ways to help a person find God is to work side by side with him and do something good. They don't have to be a believer. And people that uh, are stepping out of darkness into light, the first, like I said, the first thing they want to do is they want to do some good works. So rather than say, well, you can't get to heaven by good works, work alongside them. The Lord will show them that. Begin to repair. Second thing, the next step is you realize that you can't do good all the time. You need help. You turn to God and you believe in grace, the grace of God, what Jesus did for you on the cross. And then uh, fourthly, the next step is you turn to God, but you realize that there may be still some areas of your life that you really just need to turn over to Him. You need to renew your thinking, change your way of thinking, present yourself as a living sacrifice to become entirely sanctified. So maybe you're at that place, and uh, we can pray for you. You can write that down. I think I'm at step four. And you might want to put an arrow that shows that you're well, actually, it'd be the opposite of what, what the steps is, but an arrow that shows that you're headed in the right direction, one that goes to the side that says you're kind of stagnated right now, or, or an arrow that says, hey, pray for me. I'm really, I think I'm going in the wrong direction here. Might even do an arrow there. And then lastly, you're, you're seeking to live daily by His Spirit. And the Lord is showing you areas where you're not quite as loving of God as you need to be and not quite as loving of, of your neighbor as you need to be. And you're saying... God, help me to, look, to live daily by your spirit and love you with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love my neighbor as myself. Maybe that's where you're at. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head in the right direction there. I'm going to let God keep working in me. Uh, I'm not going to quit growing. I'm going to keep growing in that. So I'd love it if you would give me that feedback. And if there's somebody that you want us to pray for, uh, write them down. Now, some of you have done that in the past. And I, and I encourage you, if you've written the name of a relative or friend or someone, write them again. Because when you do that, I pray for them for another week. In fact, there's some people that even if you don't write it down, there's an individual here that writes their son's name down every once in a while. And I pray for him all the time. And uh, we'll pray for them. But also, by the act of writing it down, what you're doing is you're expressing faith. You're saved. It's not just for pastor or for our staff to pray for, but you're saying, I'm going to start praying for that person. I'm going to believe that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will enter their life and bring them through this process of salvation. So I'd like some feedback. If you would, that would be great. Or if there's someone you're concerned about, write that uh, down. And uh, we're going to take our offering now. The ushers can come up forward and I'll, I'll, we'll say a word of prayer. And the worship team can lead us in a song. Stay seated while we're doing the offering. After offering, pass it to you. If you want to stand, you can. Uh, most of us probably will. But I want to ask the Lord's blessing upon us. And put these uh, next step cards, put them in the offering plate. We would appreciate that. Along with your offering. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you're so patient with us. 
it wasn't just my way or the highway, but your Holy Spirit again and again and again has spoken to us, has tapped us on the shoulder and said, I want you to be closer to me. I want you to draw closer to me. Do you know that I, that Jesus died for you? That he loves you? That he loves you? Thank you for your grace. Thank you that your grace abounds, super abounds, more than any lies or sin or things of Satan around the whole world. And thank you for your grace spreading throughout the whole world. Lord, we want to live 100% committed to you to transform our minds and help us to live for you. And we give ourselves as living offerings to you, Lord Jesus. But accept these offerings as a symbol of giving ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.